Hi, everyone. Money Show is excited to welcome Alpesh Patel, author of Investing Unplugged. He is a private equity and hedge fund founder with a focus on clean tech, sustainability, and social impact. And today, he's ready to discuss where to invest in global markets. Alpesh, we look forward to your insights. The floor is yours. Thank you very much and welcome, everybody. I wish I could be there with you wherever in the world you are, but I've been locked down in the UK at the moment. Now, we're going to talk about global investments. You should be able to see my screen. That was a talk I gave uh, in 2020 in, uh, in, sorry, in 2019 in South Korea, uh, just before all the crazy COVID stuff happened. But like I said, I'm going to talk about global investments, which includes uh, US, includes UK, includes China, Asia, and all the rest of it. How do we drill down? How do we find that information quickly, easily, effectively to get the returns we want without ruining our weekends by just reading magazine after magazine or news report after news report? So I'm going to give you a very simple approach, which uh, I, as a hedge fund manager, have been teaching private investors to do and adopt. Now, first things first, I want to bribe you. I want everybody who ever comes to listen to me to be absolutely delighted. So I'm going to give the bribe at the front, okay? You can have a free copy of one of my 18 books. The rest are over there. Uh, one of my uh, 18 books. There you go. Free copy to download digitally. Just go to that website. I've also created a free instant messenger channel where every single day I will give you the most important information that we're reading. Now, it could be reports from Goldman Sachs. It could be analysis out of Bloomberg, Financial Times, whatever, whatever it is. Uh, I'll share that with you. I'll give you a top risers, whatever. That way, we found that drip feeding that free education really helps people keep up to date with the markets, okay? And there's a whole bunch of other stuff. So that's where you go. That's, that's part of the bribe. My background, just so you know, uh, I set up the hedge fund in 2004. It was a Cayman equity long short fund. We then moved into private equity alongside that. You don't care about all of that. What you care about is, well, what do we do? So what I'm going to teach you about in terms of investing, I'm going to take from all my books. I'm going to put all that information into this uh, short 30-minute presentation so that you've got the best of all of this. You don't need to read these. I'm not plugging the books. I get about a dollar in royalties from these. We've got about 80% of our sales in the US from these books, but that's not why I'm uh, doing it. Like I said, all of the stuff can be downloaded for free from Campaign for a Million, which is my campaign to teach a million people how to invest. And it's all free. And it's done through uh, various videos, free webinars, free book downloads. So you become better at investing. Okay. Uh, connect with me also on LinkedIn, uh, please. They say your net worth is directly linked to your network. So network, network with me on LinkedIn. You'll find me there and you'll see all the stuff there. So what's today about? Well, it's about the fact that I really want you to learn how to invest better yourself. And I'm going to give you the process. And part of the backdrop to that is uh, you'll have seen information like this year in, year out. That's from 2011. So it's not even just that it's happening now, but this underperformance of active fund managers has been uh, a long-term problem. However, when you tell private investors how to do it, the major problem they face is this is how they pick stocks. They'll just pick a bit of absolutely everything. They over-diversify, they duplicate, they pick up any old junk as this chap's doing there. That's how the most of them end up stock picking. So let me simplify that. They also don't know when to let go of a stock. It did well 10 years ago, so they still hold on to it, even though ever since then, it's been performing poorly. And who's to blame them? Look at all the factors involved in global stock selection. Okay, you've got valuation. Which metrics are you supposed to use? We know valuation's important uh, in share price performance, but we know it's not the only thing that's important because we know sometimes revenue growth is important. And anyway, when we look at valuation, what is important? Is it the share price relative to the profitability of the company? Uh, the earnings growth, the profit growth of the company, or maybe it's book value, or maybe it sells or discount cash flow. And maybe some of these factors vary over time. No wonder people leave it to fund managers or just give up and get confused or spend too much time finding stocks. And we also know revenue growth is important. I mean, just look at COVID. Okay, we know sales growth, in other words, is important, but we know it's not the only factor. And we know sometimes it's not relevant at all. So how are we supposed to navigate all of that, especially when is it sales growth? Is it profit growth? Is it cash flow growth? Which of these factors are supposed to be important? And when are they important? And for which type of company? Okay, and when you consider there are 9,000 companies listed 
in the United States and foreign companies listed in the United States. And if you add to that the UK companies, which I think is another major economy to look at, you've got 9,000 companies to go through. Okay, what about dividend yields? We know that's going to be an important factor because research shows it in terms of share price performance, but we know it's not the only factor because sometimes high dividend yielding companies fall in share price. And there are companies with poor sales growth, which tend to do well, or overvalued companies that do well. So the idea I'm going to put forward to you is we're not going to try and gamble on, is it value stocks? Is it growth stocks? Is it income stocks? We want to tick each of those boxes. And we need to find a simple process of interviewing all 9,000 companies quickly and effectively, just as if you're looking at the CVs of candidates who are working for you, because these companies will be working for you. They'll be working for your pension. They'll be working for your savings, for your Roth IRA or 401k. They'll be working for your children's inheritance. So we need to interview all 9,000, but quickly and effectively. And we need to interview them for valuation, for growth, for income, for momentum. They need to tick every single one of those boxes, not just gambling or speculating on now it's value. Now we're rotating to growth. I used to have a, a, a show on Bloomberg TV and you can see it over my shoulder. And they'll talk about, oh, we're getting rotation into valuation. We're getting rotation into growth. Well, I don't wanna be gambling on that and what's the flavor of the month. I need my stocks to tick every single box. Fund managers won't do that for you because the way the fund management industry is created is that their job is to maximize assets under management and therefore they'll create a value fund, maybe a, a US growth fund, a Japanese income fund, because they want to sell you more products. That's not in your interest, that's their problem. So when you do it yourself, we've got to find a process now. So now I'm giving you the macro view. We're going to find a process which ticks each of these boxes. And we're also going to look at statistics. Share prices, after all, have distributions, they move, they've got some kind of statistical valid validity. So I'm going to show you why we want prices which are consistently showing positive returns. Okay, so we want the volatility to be narrow, and we want the average return to be high. In other words, reward high relative to risk. And you might say, well, that, that just sounds too obvious. Why don't people do this? I don't know why they don't do it. Maybe they've never been taught it. So I'm going to teach you the way we've been doing it in our hedge fund but also why I think it should make sense for you to do it yourself. I don't want you to use fund managers, okay? I want you to be investing yourself. That's the great thing about Money Show. You're learning for yourself, okay? So I'm going to show you that process. Like I said, join with me on LinkedIn if you've got other questions as we go forward so we don't lose contact after today. Uh, join with me on LinkedIn. You'll find me over there. You'll see the other stuff that I do in this. The other thing I'm going to do in this uh, webinar is give you the content from my forthcoming book from the FT. Don't, I'm not pre-plugging the book. I'm going to give you the best bits in this webinar. You can also follow me on TikTok if you wish. I seem to have made a bit of a splash uh, there. That's referenced to me by uh, Business Insider. Okay. And the other insights, as well as my experience from the hedge fund industry, I'm going to give it from my network. So I get the things and the people that I hear uh, things from and the people I speak to as well. Uh, I've written over 200 columns in the Financial Times. So I'm sharing things with you, which has longevity. I've not just turned up overnight. That's me with my show on Bloomberg. That's me in 2019 on the BBC. Okay. So when you see numbers like this, right? You're probably asking yourself, where's my share? And that's what today's about. Where is your share? How do we get to those returns? So first of all, I want to show you the S&P. We're going to first look at the S&P 500, i.e. US stocks over the past year. So we know there's a hell of a lot of green there. And that's from the big caps. That's from the easy stuff. I'll show you some of the lesser known stocks in a moment. And again, people are asking, where's my share? But that's not just all we want to interview. There's 9,000 stocks, I said. We want to be looking at global companies as well. Every single one of these is listed in the US. You'll have heard of American depository receipts. These are all ADRs. So you've got Chinese companies, you've got Japanese, Indian, Taiwanese, uh, British, Dutch, German, all the rest of it. Okay. The reason we want to look at a large gene pool is when we narrow that number down, and I'm going to suggest it's going to be about 15 to 20 stocks, and I'll show you the data why it's that number in a moment then the broader the gene pool, the more selective we can be in the interview process to narrow it down. And I'm gonna show you in a second how I suggest you narrow it down. You're gonna shove it all uh, into some kind of a list so that all that 9,000 
get green lighted by valuation, by cash flow. I'll explain this in a second. Momentum, Sortino, which is performance versus volatility and outperformance of the market. So that after 30 minutes, if somebody asked you on the BBC, as they asked me, what do you like about, I don't know, AstraZeneca, you should be able to say, well, on a valuation basis, it seems relatively well priced compared to its earnings. It's got strong revenue growth. It's got a good dividend yield. It's got cash flow, which is relatively positive, good, strong momentum. Uh, its volatility is narrow compared to its average returns and it outperforms the market. There, you'll sound like an expert. You can take my role on TV instead, but I'm going to go through that. That's where we're going to end up at. Okay, that's going to be our end goal. That simplifies things. That means you've got time to smell the roses, play with your kids and grandkids and all the rest of it. The other thing I'm going to explain to you is what's the difference between a strategy and a tactic? Now, this is really important. Tactics could be which sector you wanna be in. Now, at the moment, tactically, I might want to be in medical diagnostics, real estate, consumer cyclicals, energy, financials, because of high GDP and expected inflation, right? I won't go into the details of why it's on my free Telegram channel, why those things would win. That's tactics. People mistake that with strategy. Strategy is, does this stop Tick the value, growth, income, cash flow, Sortino, alpha boxes. You can write that down. Value, growth, income, cash flow, Sortino, alpha. It pro oh, and momentum's in there as well. Those things, those things are ticking every single darn box you can have for a stock. And let me show you what the results become, how we get astoundingly good returns as a result. Similarly, similarly, that's the strategy. Within that, tactics could be a particular geography. I don't really care what your tactics are. It could be as long as it's within that strategy, value, growth, income, cash flow, momentum, Sortino Alpha. And I'll go back into what those numbers are in a second, how you find them, how you do it quickly, how you create that process in just a moment. But as long as it's within that strategy, whether you've got a particular style or geography tactically, I don't care. A market cap because you want smaller market cap because you expect a bigger return or higher volatility stocks because you expect a greater return or certain sectors, like I said, I don't care. It's gotta be within the strategy. People mistake tactics for strategy. Just because this hedge fund manager, Michael Burry, the famous big short guy, has calls on certain stocks or puts, I don't care. Tactically, you might say, well, I'm only gonna follow things he does. As long as it fits the strategy, value, growth, income, cash flow, momentum, Sortino Alpha, I don't care what tactics you use that a certain hedge fund manager looks at it, that there's a certain news item. This will stop you being swayed by news, by noise, because that's the biggest problem. You read a load of things, you get confused. Once you've got a strategy, you're no longer confused. You measure everything against the strategy. If the stock turns up in that strategy, then you might say, well, tactically, I'm going to do it because Michael Burry has. That's up to you. Or a major hedge fund like Citadel, just because they've got these puts and calls, I don't care. What I care about is, oh, that's interesting. They've got a call position on a particular stock. That fits in my strategy. Well, tactically, I want to follow Citadel. That's entirely up to you. The outcome we have when we look at that value, growth, income, cash flow, momentum, Sortino Alpha becomes this. We get what I call, actually, I didn't invent the term, square root stocks. You might have heard it. Somebody else has invented it. Um, I stole the terminology. Uh, square root stocks, okay? And it comes from this notion that they're the kinds of stocks which when the market falls shouldn't fall as far, okay? And this on the uh, left-hand side is PayPal, on the right-hand side is Microsoft. So that's Microsoft, that's PayPal. Uh, the light blue line is the S&P 500. The dark blue line is PayPal, Microsoft. I'm giving easy names. I mean, you're probably thinking, hang on, do you get paid the big bucks to come up with names that any idiot could have? No, that's not why I'll come up with other names in a second, but I want to show you the essence of what we're looking for. When the market falls, as it inevitably does and will, ours shouldn't fall as far. And when it rises, they should fall a lot. They should rise a lot more. That's the essence of a square root stock. How do we get those? Valuation, growth, income, cash flow, Sortino, alpha momentum. Without that, it doesn't happen. Statistics I mentioned earlier, one of the things we look for is this. Now, there's free resources on the internet to do this. If you look on my website, alphastrol.com, I give you a whole load of free resources. This happens to be from a free resource called Wolfram Alpha, okay? Uh, when we find stocks like this, and there are very few like this who have a return distribution like this, we will double leverage. Now, in the UK, that means contracts or differences. In the US, that will probably mean uh, options, 
okay? We will use at least two times leverage, not more. And you might think, why not more? Because we're not stupid enough to mistake leverage for genius. That's why we don't use more. The other reason we don't use more leverage is because in the short term, this is what could happen, okay? There, there's very few companies like this. And why do we pick the positively skewed ones? Well, because we want a positive expected outcome over a 12 month period. So with my double leverage, I should expect to get 100% return on companies like this. So which companies fit into this? Well, I'll name some of them, the ones you've heard of. Alphabet, Apple, Costco, funnily enough, Microsoft. We always have at least double leverage on those. Why do we have double leverage? Like I said, that way on the positive skew, I don't just get the boring return from them. We get a slightly extra bit of zip. The other things I want to share with you why I created the campaign before I return back to the spreadsheet was this. This is this. I saw this last year and it annoyed the heck out of me. UBS rich clients get Goldman strategies with no extra fee. Now, as a hedge fund manager, we get a whole load of this information crossing our desk. Okay, so what I decided was, well, I'm going to take some of this information, the useful bits, not everything, and give it for free, which I do now on that Telegram channel that I mentioned, which you can access through my website. And the reason we give it for free is because I don't think that's fair. I don't think that that information should only go to people with a 50 million private uh, wealth manager account at Goldman Sachs. Okay. I'm very proud, by the way, that the chairwoman of Goldman Sachs Asset Management is Sheila Patel, uh, and I'm grateful to Mrs. Patel for keeping those strategies. But guess what? I want to leak them. I want to sort of be a Robin Hood, the British Robin Hood, not the American Robin Hood. Take from the rich and give to everybody else, basically. So that's part of why we're doing this free campaign, because people don't realize that there's ample research done on these factors impacting the outcome. So which of these are we going to use? Well, it's the principle that's important. I want you to have a valuation factor. Now, it might be that you go with price earnings. Personally, I like the price earnings and the price earnings growth. But you might go with PB or PS. doesn't really matter as long as you've also ticked the growth box, sales growth year on year, at least for a year. Okay, it's not about, oh, is it 2.1 years? Is it one year? Is it sales growth of 0.1% or could it be 10% or whatever? Actually, it's the principle that matters. Dividend deals, I want them to have some. Now, you might say, well, there's lots of dividend, non-dividend paying companies which do incredibly well. Yes, but we're building a portfolio here for our children's inheritance and our pensions and our longevity, not for throwing the dice at a casino to see which FOMO stocks we might want to own or which SPAC. That's separate. That You can have a separate portfolio for that, but don't confuse it with this one. Okay, momentum. I want them to have at least gone up 10% in the last six months in the recent environment, at least done well. And as I said, distribution, I show you. Then tactically, tactically, once you've done that, strategically, tactically, you might look at all of these factors, which gurus buying what, which analyst, and so on. This approach, I said, will avoid gambling on fads, avoid noise, okay? You'll create your own spreadsheet. It might well look similar to mine. Value, growth, income, cash flow. I'll explain croquis in a second. That's cash flow number, okay? That's the cash flow number. Sortino, you can look up. It just means the average return and the volatility around it. Something which has been used by people to allocate money to hedge fund managers like me. If you're a pension fund or a sovereign wealth fund, you'll ask us our Sortino, not just our performance, because you want to know how consistently we hit that performance. That's what's important, okay? In the interest of time, I'm going to speed it up a little bit. Why did I, how do we pick those factors? Well, we steal. We steal and we collected it. We put it all together. Okay, that's how we innovate. I'm not, I'm not Isaac Newton. I didn't innovate or Albert Einstein. I invented by putting together what other people had already invented. It's how all great innovations happen. So how do we do it? Well, we stole, for instance, the cash flow factor from Goldman Sachs. You can take a picture of this if you wish. What they discovered is companies in the top quartile, the top 25% by cash flow, in this case measured by Crokey, cash return on capital invested, generated a 30% return per annum. How does that sound? 30% per annum. I didn't create that. That's not because, oh, Harpesh, you must be a really good stock picker. You got 30% per annum. No, the quants at Goldman Sachs figured that out. They stole it from Deutsche Bank Asset Management. Doesn't matter. We get information like this. We take it. We think, oh, right, okay. We don't just look at this factor for cash flow. Now, you're not going to be able to find Crokey uh, widely available on the internet. So you're going to have to create a proxy for it on cash flow, but look at cash flow and the top cash flow performing companies. We then still look at valuation growth because actually we're targeting 40% per annum. That's my problem, not yours. You might want to target less, 20%. But the reason we're targeting 40 is because we get 30 just from those guys, then we want more. This is, by the way, how they pick stocks for their wealthiest clients in the world. All right, this is how they do it. If you call them up and ask them, they'll tell you, yeah, we look at this, right? 
Okay, and I've been talking about this since. I mean, that's in my column in 2004 in the Financial Times. So this is not something which is, oh, he's only just telling us now. Why do I say people have too many stocks? This is why, okay? Uh, you can look at different versions of this, but essentially after you get past about 15 to 20, you're really over diversified. People do not understand diversity. In the words of Warren Buffett, yeah, put all your eggs in one basket and then watch the basket. So 15 to 20 is what I think is a general rule. Obviously take individual personal advice for your own circumstances. When we get information like this, crossing our desk, that was March 26, 2020, go look and when the market bottom hit, okay, last year. Yeah, guess what? Same date. Uh, I post it for free on the Telegram channel I mentioned earlier. So have a look at arpishwell.com to access that. My point to all of you is this. You can be better than overpaid fund managers. You might be, well, you're talking a big game there, Alpesh. How do we know you are? Well, the Financial Times said the same to me in 2004. They said, you're talking a big game. Let's put you up to the test against other leading fund managers. And they did. And I won. Okay. Bloomberg TV won their competition as well, right? The reason I'm saying this is not for a pat on the back, I'm too old to care about those things. It's to say in 2004, before I set up the hedge fund, I was a retail investor like you guys. Self-taught, okay, that you can have a copy of. It's, it's everything that I've mentioned to download. That was my interviews with the world's leading traders. Many of those were Americans. So people like Bill Lipschitz, global head of Forex at Salomon Brothers at the time and so on. So. John Najarian's in there as well, uh, uh, as well. So the point is, you can do it. I know private investors can do it. And I've been banging on about how private investors can do it since 2019. That's uh, 9-11-99, uh, my column on why and how you should be picking stocks. So I don't want you to think, oh, this is just oh, it's untested, it's untried. Actually, it's been peer reviewed. So what about selling those? All very well saying we're going to get in by ticking those boxes on valuation, growth, income, cash flow, momentum. Selling, I keep it really simple. Now you can change these rules all you want if you wish. I say to people, I want a 12 month holding. Why 12 months? I'll show you in a second. If it drops 25% from the highest it's been since you bought it, you exit. Okay, listen to that carefully. If it drops 25% from the highest it's been since you bought it, you exit. Okay, if the highest you've bought it, it goes up 100%, then drops 75%, you exit. If, it, if you buy it and that's the peak, then the most you can lose is 25%. Okay, if you've got 15 stocks and one of them drops 25%, that means your portfolio is impacted negative 1.8%. Negative 1.8% from one holding shows you that 15 stocks is not, is not too few. All right, why 12 months? Well, another piece of data out of Goldman Sachs. That's now become the typical holding period over which people and funds in particular will look at this. There's a lot more data on this, which I'm, I'm really um, not haven't got the time to go into but again if you look on the website you'll see all that free resource you'll see the academic research behind what i'm telling you and uh why i suggest private investors should be adopting that tick the value growth income cash flow uh, uh boxes not trying to gamble on tactics but instead having a strategy and then fitting the tactics within that strategy okay those are the important numbers use your cell phone to take a picture 12 months 15 stocks if it drops 25 percent from the peak you'd sell Okay, let's have a just dip into some of those tactics. I think I've got a few more minutes and then I'll take some questions as well. Okay, within that, so within that strategy, some of the tactics. And by the way, like I said, you can download not just my book, but actually these as well. Uh, Investment Philosophies, The Intelligent Investor. You can download these for free from the website. If you go on the website and then go into the free investing program, it's in there. It's part of our campaign to teach a million people worldwide how to become better investors because the private investors are basically being stuffed. I was going to say a rude word then, stuffed by fund managers who are, I'm afraid, I feel they're ripping private investors off. So we've made all that available completely for free. So one of the things we might look at as an investment tactic is what are the big hedge funds doing? That's just a tactic. It's still got to fit in our strategy. So now we're independent thinkers. We've got our strategy. This, for instance, is the Goldman Sachs list of 50 very important positions held by, um, by hedge funds. So what? Only if it fits our tactics will we uh, get into them. You might need to take a picture of this. I know there'll be a replay of all of this um, and it'll be on my website uh, as well. Okay, hedge fund ownership reports we might look at and we might say, well, those securities are added, those are dropped. We don't care as long as it fits in our strategy. So eBay does, Etsy does, then that's fine. If it doesn't, we're not interested. We might look at Warren Buffett's latest trades. So what? So what? He might have got them wrong. He might have bought them for whatever reason. We might aggregate those amongst all the gurus and look at that. Again, so what? Unless it fits in our strategy, we don't care. 
So that gives us a better, better filtering, better sifting. We'll leverage on low risk. Okay, now you might be able to do this through exchange traded funds. Uh, high risk, so be careful, learn about leverage, risk warning, risk warning. Okay, that will give you that extra zip, that two times return, but only on positively skewed stocks and only two times leverage. We'll look at what the banks are telling their richest clients as a tactic. So for instance, last April, uh, uh, the, the analysts were saying Citibank could go to 78. We don't care. What we cared about is, oh, that's also on our approved list. Let's put it that way, on the value growth income. Therefore, we think, uh, tactically, we'll go into it because the analysts are also pushing it. Well, we've got a 50% return there or 250% return with Capri. Not because an analyst has said that there's a lot of upside, but actually the reason was, the reason was, was because strategically it fitted into our uh, uh, our portfolio. And then tactically, that 250% return came out of what the analysts were saying. I won't go through a whole bunch of these. Uh, even Walt Disney, so I was surprised. Disney came up to give us a 73% return. Uh, and this was done because my sister said to me, I need something relatively safe for my children's school, for my nephews or her children's school fees. And uh, Disney came up tactically because of what the analysts were saying, uh, but strategically it fits. So I'm repeating myself a bit. Strategy, value, growth, income, momentum, cash flow, tactics, tactics could be any of these that I've mentioned, could be geography, could be what the analysts are saying. Now you've got somewhere to hang where these things are happening. Similarly, Viacom. I didn't expect Viacom to go up so much. If I did, I would have only bought one stock, Viacom, obviously. I didn't know. We knew there was some upside potential, but again, it had at the time in March 2020, it fit, fitted all uh, of the other factors. And I, yeah, I could go on, but anyway, there's a whole load more. Okay, similarly with the analysts, when we look at what they're saying, we're not just looking at one, we're looking at their track record of that individual who confirms them how big a target, et cetera. So we do all of that as well. So I don't want you to think it's as simple as that. Tactic five, riding the coattails. These are some of the hedge funds. We might look at what they're buying and selling, but it's, is it in our strategy? Just because we get a report from Goldman Sachs pushing a particular stock, we know why they're pushing is They want hedge funds like us to push it and, and become a self-fulfilling fulfilling prophecy so they look cleverer. But it's got to be within our list. I know it sounds boring. It's got to be within the list. And the list I want you to use, value, growth, income, cash flow, Momentum, Sortino, uh, Alpha, okay? Alpha is outperformance of the market, Sortino is volatility. Look on there, you can communicate with me through a number of channels uh, are on there. There's WhatsApp on there. I've got the Telegram stuff, it's all free on there. And there's the free videos to explain all of this in more detail. Uh, questions, I think we've only got about three minutes uh, for questions, I apologize. But That's okay. I'm gonna hand back for questions. Yeah, we have some questions for you. Okay, uh, the first one came from Saldi. He wants to know, for the opportunities in the stock markets of emerging countries, how do you think they can be attractive, <clears throat> excuse me, for the investors in this inflationary period? Yeah, so a couple of ways to answer that. First of all, geographically, I don't care if they're emerging or not. I put it this way, I'm not a racist when it comes to picking stocks. I don't care if you're from China or if you're from Vietnam or wherever else, you've got to perform. A company to me is like an individual because it is a collection of individuals. So that's the first thing. Inflation should mean inflation in a high GDP time. Don't forget, US GDP is set to be at about 11% normally next year. OK, so high GDP and inflation. Everyone always talks about inflation. Everyone forgets GDP. OK, in that environment, you should see financials do well because high nominal inflation means it's become easier to pay back debt. So tactically, I'm looking at more financials. Tactically, I'm looking at more real estate companies. Strategically, they've still got to hit my value, growth, income, and I don't care where in the world they come from. So sometimes we're looking at this, we get Swedish companies come up. We do get Vietnamese companies, as long as they're listed in the US. I will not invest in a Vietnamese company in their local exchange because Lord knows what's going to happen next week. I mean, you know, you might as well invest in Burma and have the totalitarian regime close the stock exchange tomorrow morning if they've got a stock exchange, uh, let alone what's happening with the Chinese markets and how they might retaliate. It's got to be an American debate repository receipts. So financials, real estate, I like medical diagnostics. Why? Well, we're out of post COVID. Are you kidding me? The amount of testing that's going on. But again, does it hit value growth income? If it doesn't hit those factors of cash flow and everything else, then I'm just speculating. Then I'm just listening to a bloke on the internet from the UK. And I'm speculating. It still is the value that the growth. And like I said, for valuation, the metrics you might use might be price earnings, 
for revenue growth, year on year revenue growth, cash flow, you'll have to find something alternative to Crokey because Crokey isn't widely available. Um, Sortino is widely available, Alpha is, Momentum is. Once you've ticked so many boxes, you should have filtered down to something good quality. Awesome answer, thank you. Uh, we just had a couple questions pop in. Where can, what software did you just have up? Uh, that was an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, I'm afraid. <laughs> okay, so we create that ourselves. Uh, and we plug in the data, the raw data. I'm afraid that's an Excel spreadsheet. Excel, you'll all have access to. Um, sources of data, well, guess what? They're widely available. I mean, I don't know, you might be able to get it from Yahoo Finance. Uh, we get it, obviously, ultimately, you're getting it from the stock exchanges. You're getting it from New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, uh, and London Stock Exchange. Okay, that's where you're getting the data from, ultimately, but there are many software vendors. We then plug it back in and look for valuation. But there are on the internet lots of screeners. What I'm saying to you is whatever screeners you use, please pick something for valuation, for growth, for cash flow, for momentum, Sortino and Alpha, and make sure you're ticking all those boxes. Otherwise, you will be mixing tactics with strategy and you'll be gambling and speculating on the next piece of news item which i don't want you to do and then on top of that 12 month holdings uh, as well so you're not gambling you're not trading your investments if you want to trade your investments that's a separate portfolio do that separately or your formo trades or your spac trades or your ipo trades that's separate portfolios this is for a slightly more stable pension children's inheritance kind of thing got it awesome um, a question from Hollis. Are there one or any more ETFs that echo your strategy? That's a brilliant question. Not that I found. Um, it's a really good question. I've not that I've looked actually, so I can't really answer that. When we look at ETFs, and there are about 5,000 ETFs. So if you look at all this, this is the ETF universe. And I'll tell you the factors we look at when it comes to ETFs. It's these two things. Uh, again, Sortino, because that shows consistency of, it means a high average return. If you remember your mathematics from school on a bell curve, it means the mean is to the right hand side and the volatility is narrow around that mean. So it's a consistent outperformer and alpha means it's outperforming the market. So there's a whole bunch here, uh, which uh, they don't do what we're saying, uh, but there is a way of replicating. We do, um, if you go to my website, we teach you more about how to create all of this uh, as well from first principles, uh, because once it's done, it's done. Guess what? I, I have tons of time, I'm afraid to say, because we don't have to now go and research and read every single darn thing on this. And it was great because we recently heard Warren Buffett. He was asked, uh, how come you invested in China Telecom many years without meeting the management, without looking at the reports? And he said, you know what? We looked at the numbers and there was such a wide gap between its share price and us buying it. Why should I go meet their management? Why should I go read um, their own reports? They're only going to say they're amazing and brilliant. You know, that's why we like numbers. We like the numbers because I'm the guy who watches the late night TV channels selling me stuff and I'll buy anything. OK, I can be sold anything. Numbers remove emotion. OK, then they can't sell me things because I'm not talking to their management. I'm trying to save myself from the worst of emotional investing. And that's why we love looking at the numbers, because then we can be detached and we can be uh, objective in what we're picking. Fantastic. Well, that puts us right about time. Um, I did post all of the links and all the ways they can get a hold of you and learn more information. Uh, but before we sign off, do you have any closing thoughts? Yeah, well, I wish you all well. Keep safe. And uh, please do learn how to invest. I can tell you, as somebody who's been, I used to be a lawyer, uh, I set up businesses. It's the passive 12-month investments and then review. You might rehold the same stuff that's actually what's been the secret to success. And not just for few, for many people, it's the passive side, whether it's real estate or investing. And I know with the Americans, and most of you will be Americans on this, um, that's where wealth is created, especially if you're an ethnic minority or you're female, that's where the wealth will be created. So please, please, please learn, learn, learn all you can 